critical is your face. How did a postage stamp change the whole course of the Panama Canal? And how does a towel dispenser work? How can you make someone look a totally incompetent idiot? For this experiment, I need two potentially totally incompetent idiots. Uh, where Hello. are you going to get them? Yeah, this yeah. time of day, Hello. where do you find them? Huh? Right, chaps, pick up right. your bits of paper. The how is this. Yeah. How do you tear off the two sides of the paper at precisely the same moment? Carol, well, any ideas? Well, you just pull them. It's dead easy. Can Go I do on, it? Go then. Years no, of university. Needs a good grip. Needs a good grip really. Yes. Yeah. Very good, Toppy. Yeah. Carol, okay. have another okay. try. Okay, I'll try another go. And one, two, three. All that education, no, no, well it's spent, more careful. It? Toppy? It's like that, Carol. It's like... Well, that's what no, you'd expect no, from right, Toppy. One gonna... last go. Okay, right. No good at all, Toppy. Really? Show us how for a while. I'll show you how. Oh, Hands sorry. in exactly the same position. Mouth goes on the middle bit like that, and then you very gently pull on the side bits like that, and, oh. and then the big moment, ta-da! Uh. And that's how you make someone look a totally incompetent idiot. <laughs> Good one. Um, how can shooting ducks teach me how to play the piano? Shooting ducks what? teach you how to play the piano. Preposterous, ridiculous. ridiculous. It might seem like a ridiculous idea, but stay with me. Now, in order to play the piano, really, you need to be able to read music. Now, this is music. The position of the notes up and down here like that tells you which note to play, higher or lower. And the position of the notes, that's the tune, and the position of the notes along this way here tells you when to play the note and how long for the rhythm of the piece. Tune and rhythm, the basics of music. Yeah? And ducks, shooting ducks. ducks. We'll get to the ducks in a moment. Oh. Now, I can be taught how to read music by this wonderful system here of a keyboard, computer, and a TV screen. All I have to do is play a game, and the game involves Roboman. This is Roboman. Now, he walks along this platform at the top here until he encounters some musical notation along the bottom there. All I have to do is play at any old note, but at the right time. And if I do that, Roboman carries on. Watch this. Here we go. If, if I get it wrong, <laughs> Roboman falls off. So I'll start again. Here we go again. And if I get it right, Roman Man carries on. All I have to do is play the rhythm of the piece. Get it? And if I get it right, watch what happens. <gasps> yes, <laughs> <laughs> Toppy. Thank you very much. What about the shooting, shooting ducks? Yeah. OK, this is where the ducks come in. This is great. The ducks are laid out on the five lines of musical notation here like this. So all I have to do is play the tune, in this case, play the right notes. And then the ducks tell me which notes to play, depending on their position on the five bars here. So, as the ducks go along, if I get the notes right, we shoot the ducks. Oops, that's too low. Ah, that's right. That's too high. That... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that... Yeah. Yep. And after a while, you should start to recognise a piece of, of music <laughs> if my play is up to... <laughs> Once I recognise this... <laughs> And that's how shooting ducks can teach you how to play the piano. <laughs> All right. Right. How can you grow two plants onto one plant? Any ideas, gentlemen? I don't think you can. Two into one won't go. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about, Carol? <laughs> well, what about this plant? What would you say this is? I would say it's a tomato plant, Carol. You'd say that it was quite obviously a tomato plant because there are tomatoes at the top. You would say yeah, that, yeah, yes. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, not quite. Now, to demonstrate this how, I'm going to need two willing volunteers, so if you would stand up immediately, oh, please. Because what I'm looking for is a crossbreed here. I'm trying to find an energetic, intellectual, muscular type of person. Unfortunately, one wasn't immediately available. <laughs> so I would like to take Freddy's top, yes, very cerebral, very brainy there, and I would like to take Toppy's bottom, because that tends to be energetic most of the time. Um, and uh, if I graft one onto the other, Aha! Uh -huh. You can see that I have the crossbreed I am looking for. The perfect man. <laughs> oh, possibly. Uh, 
What has this got to do with a how? Well, farmers often use this type of grafting, as it's known, to strengthen crops, particularly for things like pear trees. Pear trees are grafted onto hawthorn trees to make them stronger. The problem is that it only works with two plants from the same family. And here we have a ton-up taffy and a muscular Midlands maestro who are not related at all, so if you could part company, gentlemen, please, degraft immediately. Oh, that hurt. <laughs> We're really in the air now. All right, what plant is this? Tomato it's still plant. A tomato. <laughs> plant. <laughs> yes, after all that. It is a tomato plant from the top down to here because here there is a graft. The tomato has been grafted onto this plant at the bottom. And now I shall reveal what is on the bottom. It is a potato. And that is how you can grow two plants onto one. Inching. How did a postage stamp change the course of the Panama Canal? Join me on a journey of adventure as we sail all the way from Europe to Asia to confront a problem that mariners faced for hundreds of years. See if we can solve it. Off we go. We sail across the Atlantic Ocean, no problem at all, until we get to Central America. And that's where our problems start. You see, all we want to do is get from here, which is the Atlantic Ocean, over there, which is the Pacific Ocean, from the European side to the Asian side. And it's only 50 miles. But this is before the year 1914. We can't do it, because that's all solid land. What have we got to do? We've got to sail all the way around, all down South America, all around the Falkland Islands, around the dreaded Cape Horn where many boats were lost, and all the way up the other side of South America. We have gone 7,000 miles, 7,000 miles, when all we wanted to do was hop from here to there, or vice versa, which is only 50 miles. And then one day, someone had a bright idea. Let's build a canal through this little narrow bit. And they got in a chap called Ferdinand de Lesseps, a Frenchman, an engineer. He designed the Suez Canal. And he said, yes, smash it. We'll build our canal straight through Nicaragua. Absolutely tickety-boo, no problems at all. Well, actually, there was a problem. You see, one day, he received a postcard from a pal in Nicaragua. He looked at the picture on the stamp, very pretty. But then he noticed it had got a volcano on it. Did his research, found that Nicaragua was prone to volcanoes. Not very good if you're building things, particularly canals. So, no good. Back to square one, it can't go through Nicaragua. Then he thought, I shall build my canal through Panama. And, very carefully, it was built. 50 miles long, one of the greatest waterways in the world, linking the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, used by more than 11,000 ships every year, and it's so busy, they're going to build another one. And that is how a postage stamp changed the course of the Panama Canal. Now, how mathematical is your face? Gareth, what do you think? Two eyes, two nostrils, <laughs> what, one Add all mouth? the bits up. No, not quite, not quite. What do you think, Fred? How mathematical? I think yours is incredibly mathematical oh, as you? opposed to his, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about the face here, not the brain. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you think about butterflies and symmetry, now that gives you a clue. So have a look at my face now. And uh, we'll put a line straight down the middle, split the nostrils, if you would, and uh, just give me the left-hand side of my face. All right. Now, if we flip that over to give two left-hand sides, that makes one whole left carol, if you see what I mean. You can see that it looks quite strange. It's a bit like a photo fit of a... that's come from some sort of police cell. Bit of a smiley one, this one, I always thought, my left-hand side. My mother always said that's my best side. She said that to me. Yeah, did, oh, did she? <laughs> yeah. Really? All right, now let, let's start again, and let's see the original right-hand side. OK, flip that over, and this is my Cleopatra look you all there. You'll come to see. Oh, yes. Mm, very yeah. very nice, yeah. don't you think? Mm. Eyes slightly strange, though, yeah. on that side. Yes, I don't generally show that side to camera if I can at all help it. So which do you prefer, boys? The left-hand side or the right-hand side? If it's all right with Carol's mum, it's all right with me. All right, well, let's try a little blind date, shall we? We've got a lot, a lot of Carols in the studio. So let's have Carol number one. And her hobbies are mathematics and demolishing buildings every Sunday. Mm.
And panel number two, whose hobbies, strangely enough, also include mathematical puzzles, but also she has a fine collection of steel toe-cap wellies. Then we have panel number three, the lovely Carol, whose hobbies yet again include mathematical puzzling, but also eating baked potatoes and baked beans and bacon every Thursday evening. Which one would you pick out, eh? Number three, I think. Mathematically imperfect, maybe we've got a black little charm. <laughs> what about you, Gareth? Uh, I think I go for the one with the steel toe cap wellies. My kind of girl, number two. <laughs> <laughs> number two. And Fred is the winner. Carol, number three. That's me. <laughs> <That's what it. laughs> if you couldn't guess. How mathematical is your face? Well, after all that, not very mathematical at all. Here's one for you. How does a towel dispenser work? You pull it out the bottom, of course. <laughs> Yeah, and dry your hands, that's it. Yeah. Easy. That's it. But how does it work? Ah. Not so easy. Come here and I'll explain. You know the situation. You've been to the loo, you've washed your hands, and you want to dry your hands. So you go to a towel dispenser like this. Pull down a piece of towel. And then if you want to pull some more, you can't. You have to let go until it resets, and then you do that again, then it jams. How does it actually do that? Well, to explain, I'll need a bow and arrow. Now, the weight of the arrow has pulled this target down because it's hinged at the bottom, and eventually the weight of the arrow will pull it off there. The sucker will just give up the ghost. Um, all right, you need to be in hand with the weight. Ah! And immediately that drops off, the target can pop back up. And incredible as though it may seem, that is exactly the same principle on which a towel dispenser works. Let me show you inside. Right. If I pull the towel down like this, if you look in the side, you'll see a pair of suckers. I pull it down, suckers are forced together, and eventually the weight pulls the suckers apart, freeing the towel. It's simply a delay mechanism using a pair of suckers. So if anyone ever asks you, how does a towel dispenser work, now you know. How does a polar bear disguise himself? Well, on the face of it, you wouldn't think a polar bear would actually need to disguise himself because he would appear to be perfectly designed for the environment in which he lives. I mean, his fur is perfectly white and he lives in the Arctic wastes, he lives in the snow, therefore he blends in perfectly with his background. He's a great, powerful, fast hunter. He's got everything he needs, really. In fact, sometimes you can't even see the polar bear in the snow at all. So there's no problem, or is there? Well, actually, there is just one tiny problem. Well, that problem the polar bear faces will become apparent as I go into polar bear mode now and into my own polar bear costume. Where's Fred gone, Gareth? He's exactly, very... but the problem for the polar bear, you see, comes with his black nose, which makes him easy for other people to see. But against the white background, he can go into disguise. He's now right. you see me, now you don't. Ooh. Now you see me, he's blending, now you don't. Huh? He's blending perfectly with his background as I am with the white of the studio. Now you see me, now you don't. Off to the Arctic. Well, here I am in the Arctic. Let's have a look around and see what's happening. Ah, two more bears Come into disguise. Let's go and have some lunch. Let's do some hunting, Carol Bear. Hi. Oh, who's oh, that? Oh, look at this! Right, right then, I'm off. Hello, hello, hello. Is that the... Ah! 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 And that is... Where's he gone? I'm here. Hello, oh, there you are. How a polar bear disguises himself, and that's... How? For now! Woo! Oh, there you go! There you go! Oh, me tell.